Welcome back. We're here to take a look at another area of the 1920s uh, as we continue these visuals. Um, again, as, as with the last unit where we did these, don't just rely on the sultry tones of your friend Mr. Bagwell uh, to give you everything that you need. This is just a starting point for you. I encourage you to go out uh, and take a look at um, some of these things yourself. Quick internet search would give you uh, tons of new information and uh, at a deeper level than I'm able to get into here um, just for time constraints. So uh, we're going to look at some of the cultural events of uh, this part of the 1920s. Our first visual here is uh, one for what becomes known in history as the Scopes Monkey Trial. Uh, this was one of several trials of the century that happened during the 20th century, uh, but the most famous trial of the 1920s. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, a fellow by the name of John Scopes uh, is arrested in Tennessee for teaching the theory of evolution uh, in a school. Uh, this was a violation of a Tennessee law called the Butler Act. Uh, now the interesting thing is John Scopes was, um, was not a biology teacher. Uh, he was, I believe, a PE teacher, uh, but uh, they were looking for someone to challenge this law. Uh, and so he went in as a sub uh, in a classroom, uh, taught it, and was arrested uh, for doing that. Uh, and so uh, he goes on trial at, uh, at, in this little town in Tennessee, uh, and it becomes quickly becomes kind of a media circus. Uh, the guy that you see on the right in the picture here is um, William Jennings Bryan. You may remember him uh, as the Cowardly Lion from our exploration of the Wizard of Oz. Uh, he was a uh, one-time Secretary of State of the United States, uh, was a uh, three-time candidate for president uh, and also a very deeply religious man. Uh, and so he is very much for the Butler Act. He wants creationism um, as taught in the Bible, taught in schools, not Darwin's theory of evolution. So he volunteers to come down uh, and join the prosecution uh, in the Scopes case. The man on the left is um, a friend of his who will actually come to the aid of Scopes. He's the best defense attorney, maybe in American history, but definitely this time, a guy named Clarence Darrow. Uh, and Clarence Darrow is going to come to defend Scopes. Now, the interesting thing is these two men uh, were friends uh, and find themselves on opposite sides of this issue. Uh, with the birth of the radio, uh, people all around the country uh, are brought uh, in periodic updates uh, of what's going on in the court case. Uh, it's a really interesting story. I'll put up a um, uh, put up a, a video for you on the playlist. But basically, uh, these two guys uh, wrangle back and forth in court uh, trying to figure out uh, should this law even be there, right? There's no doubts. I mean, scopes are broken on purpose. Uh, so Daryl puts the law itself on trial. Uh, at one point, uh, he actually puts William Jennings Bryan on the stand uh, as an expert on the Bible, uh, and they have kind of a legendary exchange there. Uh, this big event is captured in um, a movie called Inherit the Wind, uh, or it's a stage play and then it becomes a movie. Uh, I've got a copy in the film library, but I'm sure it's something you could find out there. One of my favorite um, old actors, a guy named Spencer Tracy, uh, plays the Clarence Darrow character. Uh, in Inherit the Wind. It's a fantastic performance. Uh, when the smoke clears, Scopes is found guilty, but the judge in the trial only finds him $100. Uh, they are shocked. Uh, the proponents of the law are shocked by just the small amount of money there, uh, but Darrow says he's not going to pay it anyway. They're going to appeal. Uh, the Butler Act becomes controversial. Some colleges actually said that they were going to uh, stop accepting students from Tennessee uh, because of this, you know, because they're, they're not teaching these scientific theories. Um, and, and so it kind of becomes embroiled. Basically what this is going to do is it's going to create uh, kind of a break between um, part of the Christian culture of the day uh, and the secular culture. Uh, after this, you see the first Christian colleges uh, being founded around the country, uh, and, and there's a separation almost of the two groups uh, as they haggle 
back and forth over this. Maybe 15 years ago, uh, the opposite uh, kind of happened. You had, uh, obviously, most of you probably in your science classrooms have, have learned about the theory of evolution, uh, and there was a push in some states to include um, not creationism, but something that was called intelligent design. So this is something that still gets wrangled back and forth over with. Uh, William James Bryan dies uh, of a massive heart attack right after the trial is over with, and so his uh, time on the American stage is done. The verdict of this trial is also one of the first things to be broadcast live over the radio, uh, and so that, uh, that's a landmark event as well. Like I said, I'll include some stuff on the playlist that's, uh, that's got some more information here for you on uh, on the Scopes Monkey Trial, but it's a cool one uh, to uh, to learn about. And like I said, if you, if you like movies, that Inherit the Wind uh, is is a fantastic movie. Another trial here, um, a trial of these two men. Now, this is a painting of the two men, but uh, their names are Sacco and Vanzetti. They were two Italian immigrants uh, who, in 1920 or 21, uh, are accused of murder and robbery. Uh, there used to be guys that would come to workplaces called paymasters. They would show up. Uh, on payday with a thing full of money, and they would give it out to the workers. Uh, well, a paymaster uh, is, uh, and his assistant are killed uh, in, uh, in a robbery, uh, and as the police start to investigate, um, they find, really through some, some kind of shady means, a, a way to sackle and Banzetti's door. But basically, these guys are going to get railroaded because they're immigrants. Uh, they don't speak the language very well. Uh, and they're anarchists. They follow a guy in Italy who believed that uh, we shouldn't have governments. Uh, and so it doesn't take very long for uh, these guys, especially not speaking the language, to uh, be found guilty uh, in, uh, in a court of law and they're sentenced to death. Uh, they're from the state of Massachusetts, uh, and so Massachusetts was a death penalty state. Well, people start to get interested in this trial uh, and start to clamor for... Um, appeals. Uh, it, it becomes very clear that the evidence against these guys is really circumstantial. Uh, the, the ballistics uh, information doesn't match. They were found with a gun, but it didn't actually match what, um, you know, the, the, the murder weapon. Uh, they, had, uh, they had limited access to a Buick car, and they thought a Buick was the, uh, the car that the, the robbers drove away in, but just nothing that really directly linked these guys. There's no fingerprints or uh, that type of stuff that's going to link them. But, um, and, and so by the end of the 1920s, like 1926, 27, these guys are famous worldwide. Uh, and there are an awful lot of people, not just in the United States, but around the world that wants to see justice done. They want to see these guys freed. Uh, and so the governor of Massachusetts will appoint a special counsel uh, to kind of look over things. And that special counsel came out and said, uh, their trial was handled fine. Uh, we, we don't, think you ought to change things. And so Sacco and Benzetti will be executed. They died in the electric chair um, for these crimes. Uh, that's not where the story ends, though. There are people that continue to try to exonerate them. Uh, and producing letters and, and character witnesses and things like this, uh, it becomes fairly obvious to everyone that, no, these two guys didn't do this. It's not until 1977, though, that the state of Massachusetts and their governor, Michael Dukakis, uh, will formally apologize to Sacco and Benzetti. Now, while that's nice, it's 50 years after you send them to the electric chair, uh, so probably 51 years too late. Uh, what it does is it illustrates uh, in the 1920s um, kind of this fear of immigrants that's still very much alive in the country, uh, also these attitudes um, towards these particular groups, uh, not just immigrants but anarchists, things like that in the United States. Uh, this was a time of great political fear, as we'll see with the, the next visual we're going to do. Uh, and Sacco and Vanzetti kind of get caught in, um, caught in the middle uh, of all that, uh, and it cost them their lives. Uh, the uh, next visual I've got here for you is uh, a picture of uh, a rock formation called Teapot Dome. Uh, now, if you were in class today, I would sing the I'm a Little Teapot song and show you where the teapot is. Uh, hopefully you've seen the uh, Disney animated classic Beauty and the Beast lately because I think it's pretty obvious when you look at the, the top of that rock formation why it's called Teapot Dome. This is one of the great presidential scandals in history. 
Um, the president at the beginning of the 1920s is a man named Warren G. Harding. Uh, Warren G. Harding, by most accounts, was a pretty nice guy, except he was a really bad judge of character. He brought a lot of guys from his home state of Ohio with him uh, into the presidency, uh, and they basically used cabinet offices to get rich. Uh, and so when he, uh, there is a secretary of the interior, a guy that's in charge of our natural resources named Albert Falls, uh, who takes uh, a kickback, takes money uh, in exchange for letting a private company drill for oil uh, in Teapot Dome, Wyoming. Uh, the problem is that oil belonged to the United States Navy. Uh, and so uh, when it gets found out, it's a great scandal. This is a guy that works directly for the president that's involved in this, and people begin to wonder, did the president have anything to do with it? Well, poor President Harding uh, is actually up in Alaska uh, when uh, the clamor gets worse. So he comes back and is staying in San Francisco, getting ready to head back to Washington, D.C., uh, and he suffers a massive heart attack and dies. Uh, and so not only do we have our first big scandal of the radio era, it actually takes the life of the president. People blame the stress uh, that he was under uh, for uh, his untimely demise. Uh, Warren G. Harding, again, is also known in history as um, there was a woman who accused him of um, fathering a child with her um, out of wedlock. Uh, and so he was married, but this was another lady, uh, and said that uh, he had fathered a child and wouldn't pay child support. Uh, and we know from DNA evidence today that that's true, that uh, that, that had happened. But he had uh, several different scandals uh, going on at once, so no, um, no wonder the poor guy was under a little stress. Uh, here I've got an image of Vladimir Lenin. Now, Vladimir Lenin doesn't have much to do with American history, uh, but he is going to help lead a revolution at the end of World War I that brings communism to Russia. Eventually, Russia will become the Soviet Union. Uh, and the takeover of Russia by communists um, unsettles people around the world, but here in the United States in particular. Uh, and people start to clamor, especially people from the working class, poor people, start to clamor for um, the seeming... Um, a leveling of the playing field, I guess, that comes from uh, adopting communist beliefs. Uh, and so in the 1920s, we have what we call our first Red Scare. Uh, and the Red Scare was the idea that the government went around, there was actually a guy, a Mr. Palmer, who worked for the government, that went around trying to um, find and arrest people who had communist beliefs. Problem is, we've got this little thing in the United States called the Constitution. Uh, and the Constitution uh, basically says you can't arrest people uh, for having different political beliefs than you do. If you want to be a communist in the United States, you have the right to be a communist in the United States. Uh, the American Communist Party actually runs somebody for president uh, every time we have president. They're not going to win, but they still have a right to do that. Uh, and so, but people get so freaked out by this idea that communists are going to come take over the United States um, that they are willing to watch some liberties uh, be trampled on. Vladimir in Lenin is an interesting dude. Uh, story goes that he is actually poisoned uh, and, and will die. Um, and the guy that takes his place is a guy we're going to look at in World War II. His name is Joseph Stalin. Uh, well, Lenin's body, uh, they actually wanted to preserve because you don't have uh, communist countries aren't big on religion, and so they usually try and set up the leader of the country uh, as kind of this figure uh, to, to give your devotion to. And so they actually will uh, kind of mummify his body and put him in a glass coffin, uh, and it's in Moscow. You can actually go see Vladimir Lenin. Apparently they break him out every once in a while, put him in a new suit, uh, but Vladimir Lenin is still there. Uh, Moscow's pretty low on my travel bucket list, so I'm not sure I'll make that one. Uh, but if you get there, Send me a picture. So that is going to be our uh, kind of political uh, and big news story uh, set of visuals there. Once again, check back to the playlist, uh, and I'll throw some videos up uh, to give you some additional information.